Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Hey, good morning, everybody. Oh, today we're beginning this new series on how to help the people around you when they're going through a hard time. I wonder if you know anybody uh, in your life. Is anyone in your life uh, struggling with something, going through a hard time right now? I wonder uh, if they've maybe lost a loved one or um, have a relationship that's ended or maybe they've been diagnosed with an illness or uh, they're struggling in some way, uh, maybe facing death or depression. Maybe they're overwhelmed by the demands of life. Does anyone fit into one of those categories. If someone comes to mind, would you just raise, raise your hand, just lift up your hand. Yeah, everybody's got somebody in their life who's struggling that they want to know how to help, and that's what this series is all about. If you're not uh, familiar with a sermon series, what we do is we just take a topic or a thing we're struggling with or uh, some, you know, passage of scripture, maybe a theme verse or a whole book of the Bible, and we just work through those uh, things for several weeks. And my hope is that this series is going to encourage you on helping your friends and better equip you um, to help them for those tough times. Uh, before we get too far, I just want to thank you for celebrating Easter with us last weekend. Uh, we had over 2,000 people join us for an Easter service. We baptized 10 people, had several people come to uh, faith in Jesus Christ to re- recommit their life uh, to following Jesus. And at Rockbrook, we have a vision for our lives. We have a process we want to help people with. Uh, it's a process we find in Scripture. It's this process right here. We want to help people know God. Come to know God, the real God. Uh, that, uh, that's where salvation is, when you come to know God through Jesus Christ. And so we want to introduce you to Him and uh, help you know Him. And if you know Him, we want to help you know Him better. That's what the weekend worship service is all about. And we want to help people find freedom because we all need it. We, we all have hurts and habits and hang-ups that we need to break free from in our lives. We have wounds of things that we've done, things that have been done to us that we need to get untied from and you can't do it alone you have to do it with the help of other people so we have people that uh, group together to help one another small groups we call them they give you a place to connect with other people who are following Jesus and we're really serious about helping uh, people find freedom so we also have celebrate recovery uh, that's a Christ-centered recovery program that helps you uh, break free from addictions and hurts and and hang-ups and then God uh, does things on purpose, uh, for a purpose. He has things He wants you uh, to discover about Him. Discover uh, about uh, the world, discover about the church. And He wants His purposes to be known. So our growth track is a way to help you uh, discover God's purposes for the church in your life. And it's a track that ultimately gets you on a team where you can start making a difference in Jesus' name. And so we have people on the team, we call them the dream team, and these are people that have uh, joined together uh, and working together to do something we can never do by ourselves as an individual. Individually, we are amazing, but together we're unstoppable. And these are the people that come together and and serve multiple services and, and pull off an amazing Easter, and they're opening up their home and just so many amazing things. But the question this series asks is, how do you help people personally through these things? How do you help someone uh, know God through the tough times in life? You know, when, when God wants to prepare soil for a seed, what does He do? He sends a storm. And the same thing is true in our lives, that storms often uh, can prepare, uh, prepare us for a breakthrough, prepare us uh, for something that God has for us. So how can we help people know God through the storm in their life? How can you help uh, your friends find freedom in the tough times of life? How can you help them discover purpose, that there is purpose in your pain, that pain is not purposeless? And how can you personally make a difference in someone's life? You know, you don't, you don't need a lot of friends. You just need a few good ones that are going to show up in the middle of a crisis. But my question is how many people around you today would say that in a crisis, they knew you would be there for them. In the middle of a crisis, they they know that you would be there for them whatever it took. And my guess 
is several people would say that about you. Because I know who I'm talking to today. I'm talking to Rockbrook. You guys love people amazingly. Uh, talking to people who showed up to a series about helping friends through tough times. Say, I want to help my friends. So I just, can you equip me a little bit or can you just show me what to do? Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says, two are better than one. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. The Bible tells us that wise friends are a gift from God. So what is the characteristic of a friend? Proverbs 17, 17. Would you read this out loud with me? It says, friends love through all kinds of weather, through all kinds of storms, through all kinds of things. So we're going to look at the different storms that come into people's lives and we can, how we can help them through those tough times. In 1967, there were a couple of very well-known uh, psychiatrists who did a study uh, that is now quite famous, it's world famous, where they were uh, studying to find the correlation or the connection between stress and illness. And they were trying to find if there really was a connection between severe stress in your life and a major illness. And Thomas Holmes and Richard Rock did a study of 5,000 medical patients. As a result, they developed uh, 43 common stressful events And these are things that people go through in life, and they gave them, uh, just kind of ranked them on a scale of 1 to 100, 1 being no stress, 100 being the most amount of stress uh, that you can have as a common thing in life. And uh, they discovered that anybody with over 300 points of stress was at risk of developing uh, major illness in life uh, that year. And they concluded that the most stressful event in life was uh, the death of a spouse, that that's the... The, out of the common stresses, that's the most stressful thing you can experience in life, the death of a spouse. Many of you have, have gone through that. Uh, the second most stressful event is a divorce from a spouse, and the third most stressful event in life is separation from a spouse. And it's interesting to me that either, however it happens, um, uh, the relationship ending or uh, happening in a marriage is one of the hardest things to go through. And this week, I want to talk to you about how to help, help a friend through that. And uh, I'm going to give you transferable principles that really, these will apply to however a good friend in your life is struggling. Um, but you would do well to specifically, if you have a friend who's struggling with the loss of a relationship, uh, to specifically apply this uh, to them. Uh, how do you help a person who may be... Um, They fought the divorce. They didn't want it. How do you help them through that time? The fact is that uh, many people are part of a divorce they did not want. They opposed it, but they didn't have any choice. It takes two people to make a marriage last. I I wish you cannot save a marriage by yourself. I wish you could. I desperately wish you could. But you can't. Sometimes circumstances are beyond your control. And so what we're going to do today is look at how do you help a friend go through a devastating time like the loss of a relationship. And the Bible gives us about seven things that you can do from the Word of God that will help you um, during that time. I'm going to give you three of them today, and then um, it'll be, we'll end, we'll be to be continued, we'll come back and hit four more next week. And uh, if you bring someone with you next week, no worries, I'll do a quick Avengers recap-like thing to get everybody up to speed, and then we'll get, get fill in all, all seven. Uh, but here's the first one. Number one, real friends, and, and none of these are going to be a surprise to you today, okay? These are, but we can't forget these. We can't gloss over them. We can't move past them. These are the first responses. Number one, is real friends show up. When your friend is going through a tough time, they're going to get emails, they're going to get cards, they're going to get texts, they're going to get calls, they're going to get opinion after opinion, and real friends show up in the middle of that crisis. It's in a crisis that your friendship is defined with the other person. Crises make friendships. Crises define friendships. Crises bond friendships. Did you know that the Bible says that even when people turn their back on God, they still deserve to have friends? That even when somebody says, well, I don't don't even believe in God right now. I'm angry at God. I don't even know what God is doing in my life, that they still deserve to have friends. Job 6.14 says, when desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them. 
And God says that even when they turn their back on me, I want you to befriend them. Because the first thing everybody needs in a crisis is other people. Not hundreds, not dozens, but a support group. Some mature Christian brothers and sisters who are there to love, care, comfort, encourage, support, and meet needs. This is why I just never stop talking about the importance of a small group and having mature Christian brothers and sisters around you. They keep telling you if you're not in a group, you need to get in one because get in one now. Build a network, a safety network in your life so when the rogue winds of life come, you have genuine friends. But this series turns the tables. We need to not only be in groups to receive support, but to help other people. Not just to receive it, but to give it. That's the first thing that the people need in a crisis is other people. And we need to be there for other people. People, this is just unselfishness to build into other people's lives so we're there for them in the tough moments. Because the first thing we need in crisis is other people. Now maybe you say, wait a minute, don't you need to pray first? Like, isn't that the motto, pray first? Well, yeah, if you can. But truth is, in a crisis, we're usually under so much stress, a friend is under so much stress and shock, they don't know what to pray. And it's at that point you need other people praying for you. That's when when you're in a crisis, you need other people. You need to say to them, we'll believe for you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to be there for you. Because you can't even think straight in a crisis. This is what happened in the story of Job. You know that Job was the uh, wealthiest man in the world. And uh, in a day he loses everything. He loses his, um, his wealth and his family and loss of relationships and lost his resources and lost all of his health. He became very sick and his friends did the right thing. Now, if you read the book of Job, uh, it goes haywire there for a while in the minute, in the middle. Uh, His friends didn't always say the right thing, didn't always do the right thing, but at first they did do the right thing. Here's what they did, Job 2.11. When Job's three friends heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. They formed a small group. They said, we're going to be with our our friend Job and we're going to support him. We're just going to show up. And that's exactly what they did. And that's how you can be a friend. If you've earned that right in their life, you show up and just take care of stuff. So often what we say to a friend in need is we'll say, if you need anything, let me know. But when someone is going through a trial and going through a crisis, they don't have the vision to delegate. They don't have the vision uh, or they don't need another thing to do by finding something for you to do. You just show up. You just take care of of what you can and just, just pray about it and see how can I help this person. Now, let me just say this message, um, isn't about if you're in a crisis right now, but if you are in a crisis, please, as your pastor, I'm begging you, do not put people at arm's length. Do not shut people out. Do not uh, shell up. Do not build walls. You need people, particularly believers in your life during that crisis. And I would encourage you, if you're in a crisis, if you're in the middle of one right now, to go to Celebrate Recovery this Wednesday night. If you've plugged into a small group, but uh, you've kind of unplugged, I'd encourage you to connect back and reach back out to them or get into a small group this next semester. Number one, you show up. The second mark of a true friend is you share their pain. You share their pain. It's an interesting thing about pain and about joy because whenever you share uh, joy, it gets multiplied. It gets doubled. If something good happens in my life and I, and I share it with you and you celebrate, the joy just multiplied. My friend Chris Brown, the worship pastor here, if anything remotely good happens in my life, I call Chris because he celebrates it like it's the best thing that ever happened and the joy gets multiplied. But the thing about pain is when you share pain with somebody, it's not multiplied, it's halved because now other people are carrying the weight with you. It's not all on you by yourself. Someone else is helping carry the load. When you share a joy, it's doubled. When you share pain, it's halved. And the ultimate form of of love 
is compassion because compassion lifts the burden. Compassion says, I want to do whatever I can do to ease the pain. And Jesus was repeatedly moved to compassion. So much so that he says, I'll die on the cross to ease your pain, to stop your hurt. That's compassion. Now, I want to be clear because of the seven things I'm going to give you over this week and next, this one is maybe the trickiest. Uh, Because uh, this sharing pain does not mean that you have to take on the pain or the dysfunction of a friend into your life. That you don't, you don't have to go through a relationship ending to relate to and help someone through the tough time of a relationship ending. You don't have to become depressed to help a friend with depression. You don't have to have the pain to have compassion. You don't have to have the pain to share in the pain and to identify with them. In fact, God may have put you in their life to be strong where they are weak, and they're going to be strong where you are weak. That's why you're friends. So you don't have to go through a tough time to share in a tough time to be compassionate. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Compassion is exactly what Job's friends did right at first, Job 2, 12 through 13. When they saw him from a distance, when his friends saw Job from a distance, they could hardly recognize him because of the illness because of the pain that he's going through they began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads which was a way of showing sorrow and mourning they're identifying they're sharing the pain they're saying we're en- we're entering into this with you we're going to mourn with those who mourn but notice it doesn't say that they went and destroyed their homes They didn't have to go put themselves in the same circumstance, same situation to identify with with his pain. Verse 13, then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. I love this. What do friends do? They show up and they shut up. Friends, good friends are slow to speak. They're not quick to give advice. They're not quick to say something. They're not quick to say, certainly I told you so, or something hurtful. They're not even quick to say something helpful. Like In your small group, when someone shares a doubt or shares a pain or a struggle that they're going through, are, are you too quick to offer a solution? Are you too quick to offer a response? Or do you identify with them? Do you share in the pain first? Do you listen? Make sure you really hear and understand what they're saying, where they're coming from. Good friends are, are slow to speak. They share the pain first. They don't say it's going to be okay. They don't, even, they don't even quote Bible verses at first. They don't say God works all things together for the good of those who love him. We do that later. But in these moments, they said, we're just going to sit here with you, Job. And they sat with him in silence for seven days. Have you ever done that with, for a half hour with somebody? Now, this one, again, this point is, is tricky. You've got to have a lot of dis- ask the Holy Spirit for discernment. Because this does not mean, particularly if you're helping a friend through a tough time like a divorce, sharing the pain with somebody does not mean uh, going over to their house or connecting with them and trash talking the person who has hurt them. Saying, well, he's no good anyway, or she's not worth it, or he, bad-mouthing the ex. That's actually counterproductive. And most people who have gone through a relationship ending, most, most of them tell their counselor, that, that was not helpful, that was harmful. I don't need to hear what a lousy person my husband or my wife is in those, those moments. And actually, friends, good friends are a proponent of marriage. Sharing the pain doesn't mean putting somebody else down. It just means I'm here to lift you up. I'm here to support you. I can't imagine what you're going through. And it, it hurts. You show up. You share their pain. The third thing uh, real friends do is support them with prayer. Because when they're going through a divorce, a death, a bankruptcy, anything else, you're going to want to pray for them. You're going to want to pray with them. You're going to want to pray over them, out loud with them. Does prayer really make a difference? You know, uh, in our nation, in our culture, prayer uh, is just getting mocked 
and laughed at more and more. It used to be that we had a goal to be a nation of prayer, and now uh, the idea of responding to a tragedy with prayer uh, is looked at as being uh, less than, is looked at as being foolish, is looked at as being not, not near enough or a bad response, and I can tell you exactly why that is. It's because it takes faith to pray. And if you don't have faith, it doesn't mean anything to you. It takes great faith to pray. Prayer is a demonstration of faith. And to respond with prayer takes faith. And we often ask, well, why pray? What's the point? Uh, when God knows the future, is already in control of everything, why pray? Well, we pray for a variety of, of reasons. Okay? Scripture tells us that prayer is a form of serving God, of obeying God. God commands us to pray. You read through the Gospels and you see Jesus thought it was worthwhile to pray. I read the other day that Jesus uh, went over to this mount to pray, and it had two words in there. He went over there to pray as usual. And those two words just stuck out to me, that he's, this was not an abnormal thing, that, that the writer isn't saying that he, him going over there to pray was even that monumental. It was just what he usually did, as usual. I just underlined those two words and thought, if I'm not usually going to a place to pray, I'm not following Jesus because that's where Jesus was often headed, was as usual going there to pray. To pray. Jesus thought it was worthwhile to pray. In, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, it says that prayer is the means of strengthening other people spiritually. That's how you strengthen someone spiritually is through prayer. And that prayer is not about trying to get our will, God to do our will on earth, Prayer, but prayer is how God's will gets done on earth. Prayer is how God's will gets done on earth. And prayer is how we discern His will. Prayer makes a difference. And in one sense, prayer is like sharing the gospel with people. We don't know who's going to respond to the message of the gospel until we share it. In the same way, we're never going to see the results of prayer unless we pray. In my small group, uh, we put down prayer requests in a prayer app in our phone. And then we did a study one semester that uh, we put them in a book. We recorded them in a book, and then we took a break. Then we came back for the new semester, opened up the prayer app to see all these things we were praying in our small group. And we just rejoiced as we saw how God was working and doing different things and responding to our prayers. So, well, you got this job that we were praying you would get. And, and, oh, yeah, you know, your baby was born. And this scare, you know, that God took care of this. And, and this, look how much progress has happened on your adoption. And, and look at, man, God has healed this. And just seeing how God was working, prayer makes a difference. A lack of prayer demonstrates a lack of faith. And when we pray, we demonstrate our faith in God. And prayer is our primary means of seeing God work in other people's lives. Because prayer is our means of God's power. You know, you can't, you can't control other people. Have you learned that yet? <laughs> but you can pray for them. And prayer is our primary means of seeing God work in other people's lives. So maybe you say, okay, Rylan, I'm in. I want to pray for them. I don't know what to pray for them in the, those moments. Well, let, me, let me give you some scriptures of what to pray, and I'll just give you uh, something you can write out to each side of those scriptures to pray for a friend who's hurting. The first thing you want to pray for a friend is, Lord, help them recognize your presence. Lord, help my friend know that you're hurting, that you're here with them. Help them to feel that you are not distant, you're not far away. You are near. You are here. You are alive. It's the first thing people need to hear. You pray for them out loud. Because when you're hurting and you're going through a tough time, especially like a relationship ending, you feel very, very alone. So the first thing you pray is Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Where is God when you're going through a tough time? He's close. He's close. God draws close to the brokenhearted. So we say, God, help people realize, recognize your presence. Second thing we want to pray is, Lord, help them receive your grace. 
Lord, help them receive your grace. Why? Because grace is what they need to make it. Grace is the power to see it through. Grace sustains. Grace is the energy to help you keep going when you feel like giving up. Grace is the power to change. God's grace in your life is what you need when you have nothing left to give. When you say, I've got nothing left to give this relationship. I have nothing left to give you, Lord. I have have no place to go. Grace is what you need. And so we say, Lord, I I don't want them to just know that you're here. I want them to receive your grace. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We come to God and say, I need your help. And we receive that kind of grace. God asks us to come boldly. You know, the only person who would wake up a king in the middle of the night for a glass of water is a child. They'd be the only one bold enough to do it. And God says, you are my child. Come confidently. Come boldly to me and find the grace that has the power to stand up under sorrow and stress. And the next thing we pray is, uh, third thing you pray is, Lord, help them to receive, help them to release their pain. Help them release their pain. Lord, help them to express exactly how they feel. Lord, help them to unload their burdens, to ventilate, to, to get it off their chest. Lord, help them to put into words what they're feeling. What are you doing there? You're encouraging them to cry out to God. To cry out to God. What does it mean to cry out to God? It means to come before God and passionately tell Him how you feel. There's a prayer I've prayed a million times in my life. God, you've got to help me. You've got, I don't know what to do. I'm not smart enough for this. I don't have the wisdom for this. It's totally beyond my control. God, you've got to help me. You've got to help me in this. And that's crying out to God. And when you come before God and cry out and say, God, you've got to help me. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I can't figure this out. I have no energy left for this. That's crying out to God. And you need to be able to help your friend do that. Psalm 142 says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for his mercy. Do you hear the passion in that? I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. For I am overwhelmed. And you alone know the way I should turn. Is it okay to complain to God? Absolutely. God wants to hear your complaints. He'd rather you complain to him than other people. God understands your emotions. You know God has emotions. You're, the reason you have emotions is because you are made in the image of God. You know, sometimes we think of God being on his throne just so stoic and emotionless. We, scripture says that the heaven rejoices when child comes back to God, that that God celebrates that. He rejoices in that. God has emotions. God gets sad. He sees persecution. He sees people hurting, going through a tough time. It saddens him. God gets mad. He's, He's angered. He has emotions. And he gave you this emotional ability. Why is this so important? Because when you're going through a crisis, or you have a friend going through a crisis, they're a bundle of emotions. They're going to feel hurt. They're going to feel rejection. They're going to feel despair and frustration, regret, failure. And God says, I want you to bring that to me and express that to me. And a good friend shows up, shares the pain, and helps them express that with prayer. So we're just going to push pause in the middle of these seven things, and we're going to pray uh, together right now. Would you bow your head? God, we're crying out to you. And God, we just say, we don't know what to do. Help us, Lord, help us. You put this desire in our heart um, to be a godly friend, a godly family member, but we can't do it alone. Help us, and please help our friends. You may not know the people uh, sitting around you or sitting on either side of you, But I want you to pray in your heart and mind privately for them. Here's what I'd like you to pray. Say, Lord, help the person on my right recognize your presence. 
Help them receive your grace. Help them release their pain. God, please heal the hidden hurts of the person on my right side. And then just do that for the person on the other side of you. Lord, help the person on my left recognize your presence. Help them receive your grace. Help them release their pain. God, please heal the hidden hurts of the person on my left side. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.